Welcome to Cincy Reformed Podcast. I'm Pastor Brandon. I'm joined with Pastor Zach. We are pastors at Westside Reformed Church, a URC congregation in the west side of Cincinnati. And today we wanted to talk about um, means of grace. And that's a phrase that um, is used a lot in Reformed circles, but um, largely unknown in, I think, broader um, kind of evangelical landscape here. Uh, and so, Zach, before we kind of jump into talking about, you know, uh, what all of these, um, uh, what the means of grace are, maybe you can kind of help us to think about um, what is a means of grace. Sure. When we think about salvation in Jesus Christ, we need to think about and ask the question of how does that salvation uh, become ours? How does God deliver Christ and his saving benefits, forgiveness, sanctification? How does he deliver that to the Christian? I think if, if uh, we were to um, uh, read from the Bible that you know God delivers Christ and his benefits to us whenever we eat Cheerios for breakfast... Well, then we'd all run out and grab boxes of Cheerios and make sure that we're eating Cheerios for breakfast. Or if you said, oh, well, I'm going to give you Christ and his benefits when you take long walks in the woods all by yourself, then we'd all be going and taking long walks of in the woods by ourselves. In other words, where is God meeting us with saving grace? And how is he delivering that saving grace to us? Is he using something? Or maybe someone, like, oh, he doesn't use anything at all. We just live our lives and go around and God will just mysteriously give Christ to whomever he feels like it. Well, that's not what we find in the Bible. We find in the Bible that God has uh, identified certain places and times and certain methods that he will use to uh, deliver the Lord Jesus Christ uh, to us and not just delivering Christ, but all of his benefits, his saving uh, blessings to his people. So that's really what we mean when we say a means of grace. It's an instrument that God has appointed, not man. We can't invent some way that binds God to act. We can't invent some means that forces God's hand. But an instrument that God is pleased to use when and where he desires, where and that he ordinarily uses to send forth the Holy Spirit to bring salvation and strengthening to his people. So that's what we mean by a means of grace. We just read here from the um, Heidelberg Catechism, question 65, which I think is a very helpful place to begin this discussion. And then, Brandon, I'll ask you in a second to help us uh, think through some of these more specifically. But in question 65 of the Heidelberg Catechism, the uh, question is, it is by faith alone that we share in Christ and all his benefits, where then does that faith come from? The answer is, the Holy Spirit works it in our hearts by the preaching of the Holy Gospel and confirms it, he confirms faith then, by the use of the Holy Sacraments. So there we kind of um, we begin down that path of saying that, that God is pleased in Christ by the Spirit to use the preaching of the gospel, and the sacraments to create faith and then strengthen faith. Brandon, would you mind kind of leading us off from here in terms of how those, how we might think about those things? So, yeah, um, like the Heidelberg said, the means of grace are the word and sacraments. Uh, word and sacrament are the means of grace. They are the instruments that God has ordained uh, to use, uh, to work through, that, um, uh, that we would... Um, hear by the word and, 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 and believe. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. Um, and also the sacraments would be that place or, or would be those things that strengthen and nourish our, our faith. Um, a couple texts from the Bible that we would uh, kind of point to in terms of baptism, I, I think as Romans chapter 6 uh, kind of shows us, Paul is able to remind a church about their baptism when they're struggling and, and dealing with sin. Uh, as they're thinking through sin, he's able to bring them back to their baptism. Uh, 
Remember your baptism. That was a, a powerful thing. It was uh, something to be remembered. It, 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 it uh, was a strengthening thing, not only at the time that it was done, but just all throughout their life, uh, a time of, of reflection and re- remembering um, their baptism. In um, 1 Corinthians 10, 16, it says that when we take the Lord's Supper, that there is a present participation, a present fellowship, a present koinonia with the uh, body and blood of Christ in heaven, with the risen and ascended Christ. Like There is a spiritual, a heightened spiritual presence of Christ uh, where we feast upon Christ spiritually through faith uh, as we take the, the sacraments. And so the... Uh, the word and baptism and Lord's Supper then would be what we mean when we talk about um, the means of grace. And I had a few places in the Heidelberg Catechism that I thought would be helpful to read. Um, the first one on baptism, question 73 says, Why then does the Holy Spirit call baptism the water of rebirth and the washing away of sins? The answer God has, has good reason for these words. To begin with, he wants to teach us that the blood and spirit of Christ take away our sins, just as water removes dirt from the body. But more importantly, he wants to reassure us by this divine pledge and sign that we are as truly washed of our sins spiritually as our bodies are washed with water physically. And then another reading um, from question 79, this regards the Lord's Supper. Why then does Christ call the bread his body and the cup his blood, or the new covenant in his blood? And Paul uses the words a participation in Christ's body and blood. The answer, Christ has good reason for these words. He wants to teach us that just as bread and wine nourish the temporal life, so too his crucified body and poured out blood are are true food and drink for our souls for eternal life. But more important, he wants to assure us by this visible sign and pledge that we, through the Holy Spirit's work, share in his true body and blood are surely, as surely as our mouths receive these holy signs in his remembrance, and that all of his sufferings and obedience are as definitely ours as if we personally had suffered and made satisfaction for our sins. In other words, um, they are signs and pledges. They are signs and seals of of redemption, of uh, Christ washing us. And I always reflect, too, on, um, on Noah, for example. Uh, Noah, he was given the sign of the rainbow. And, you know, I often wonder what it was like for Noah after the flood. He, he leaves the ark and he sees, a, he sees a thunderstorm for the first time post-flood. Well, the last time he saw that, everybody on the planet drowned. And so I just wonder, you know, what it had caused maybe some anxiety. Uh, wondering, oh, oh my goodness, the last time I saw this, everybody drowned. And of course, he had the word of God, the word of God that said, I will never flood the world again. So he had that verbal promise from God, but then he also had the sign, the rainbow in the sky. So as he saw the bow appear, it would have been a visual reminder to both God and Noah that God is not going to flood the world again. And, um, you know, as we view a, view a baptism, as we remember our own baptism or think back on the fact that we were baptized, we are um, seeing there that the promise of God that just as the water washes away dirt from the body, so Christ, by his blood and spirit, washes away our sin. As we see the wine and the bread, we are seeing that redemption that Christ um, Um, secured for us. The sacraments are visible words of God that confirm and seal uh, Christ to us. So those would be kind of the three um, things that we that we that we talk about when we speak of means of grace. But you know, even as we were talking about this, Zach, we use words that maybe some people from a more evangelical background might not have um, 
uh, might not use on a daily mm-hmm. basis. So we use the word sacrament, for example. Mm-hmm. Many other people use the word ordinance instead of sacrament. Um, baptism and the Lord's Supper are usually not spoken about as means of grace in, in, in broader evangelical circles. Uh, typically, the way that baptism is, is, is talked about is, you know, baptism is my first step of obedience. Baptism is my public declaration to the world. The Lord's Supper is my remembrance. And so sometimes uh, the sacraments are are thought of more on the longs, uh, along the lines of law rather than gospel grace. Mm-hmm. Um, so how, how do we understand these things? How, how would you, I guess, one, define a sacrament, mm-hmm. and then two, you know, how are, you know, specifically, like, how are they means of grace? Some people might hear that, and think of like a soda pop machine. You hit a button, and then grace pops out. Is that was is that how we should think about baptism and the Lord's Supper? I hit a button, and out, boom, pops grace in a mechanical way. You know. So what is it? What is a sacrament, and how specifically are baptism and Lord's Supper means of graces? Yeah, great question. I think that uh, certainly, as you're hinting at there, it's not like a soda pop machine. We don't view these sacraments as some sort of mechanism, pull the lever, something happens, no. Uh, As I mentioned earlier, it's something that God is pleased to use, and He has appointed it because He will ordinarily use those uh, methods for salvation, and He will use those uh, for uh, for His elect in due time. And so... We, we avail ourselves of, of the um, of preaching of the gospel and the, the administration of the sacraments. We trust that God will use them. We can't uh, twist his arm to use them exactly how we want them to be, how we want him to use them in that moment. But we do uh, humbly come before them and avail ourselves of them. The uh, sacraments, when we think about this language, you're right that Many people use the word ordinance, and that gets at the point that God has ordained it, I think, is the the notion that God has appointed something to be done, and so we're giving God honor and respect and calling them an ordinance. That's fine. But the word sacrament gets at something a little bit more than just the fact that God has appointed something. It gets at at the fact that God has appointed uh, a mystery as well that is part of that ritual. The... um, Catechism, again, we've come to the catechism a lot. It's very helpful here. Question 66 asks, what are sacraments? Sacraments are visible, holy, signs, and seals. And it kind of goes on a little bit to unpack what that means, but the, the bread, the wine, the water are appointed by God to be a sign and seal of something. It's not just a mere object lesson. It's not just this mere external ritual that's conducted to merely teach us some new, some facts, but it signifies an invisible reality that it seals unto us a mysterious act of God, whereby he comes to us to impress upon our souls, to feed our souls, to wash our souls, just as that external act teaches us and indicates to us. And so when we use that word sacrament, that's really what we're getting at, is the fact that it's more than meets the eye, because God by his spirit is pleased to work um, through those uh, through those means, and not only at the time that the sacrament is being administered, but really throughout our lives, God is working to impress upon us the, the washing of Christ, the nourishment of Christ, and that is being testified to us in the uh, in the sacraments. So I hope you can kind of see why Brandon said what he did about the fact that we're not talking about some mere bare ordinance whereby we act and we um, uh, obey, and that as if baptism and the Lord's Supper are all, all about us. Hey, it's all about me, God. Hey, look at me. I'm obeying you. I'm doing the same you told me to do. I'm faithful. There is a very slight element of that going on there where, yes, we are uh, responding to God's instruction. But more importantly, God has appointed these things for his action of faithfulness toward us. His action to say, I'm with you, not so much you're with me. 
But hey, I'm with you. I'm promising to you. I'm saving you. And so rather than being in a position of, hey, look at us, look at what we're doing, and which could be actually conducive to pride, mm-hmm. this is actually a position of humility where we humbly avail ourselves of what God has appointed for us to then humbly receive the salvation that we find in Jesus Christ by the working of the Spirit. A mystery occurs. We can't comprehend it. We can't pin God down. We can't tell him exactly what he should do and how he should do it. But we know that God is pleased to save his people through the preaching of the Holy Gospel and the administration of the two sacraments. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on that, Brandon? Things you might reflect on there? No, I like that. Um, And, uh, you know, it, it... in other words, the main arrow in baptism and the Lord's Supper is God to us. Mm-hmm. And only secondarily would it be you know, us to God or anything like that in terms of response. Right. But the primary arrow is, us, is God to us and not us to God or us to the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's something that's being received. We are, we are receiving um, that. We're receiving Christ. Um, Christ is being communicated. Our faith is being strengthened and nourished. And the redemption purchased by Christ is being brought to us um, mm-hmm. as the Holy Spirit brings us to heaven during, during the, the, uh, the Lord's Day. That's right. And I think maybe at this point it would be helpful to talk and reflect about on um, how this changes the way that ministry happens, Mm -hmm. how this changes worship, how this changes the way that a church views itself. Uh, This is going to change a pastor's outlook on things, a church's outlook on things, and a a congregation's expectations as well. So could you maybe talk us through some various ways that this will shape the uh, ministry and worship of a church? Right. So uh, it's really connected. I mean, all of this is connected with, you know, how, who you think God is, who you think you are, how you think you're saved. Um, if, if you think salvation is of you, um, then uh, worship is going to be of you. And it's going to be very you-centered. If you're doing, if you're ascending the mountain, as it were, if you're uh, coming to God by your own um, free will and merits and, and, and own, your own intrinsic faith or something, then everything's going to kind of, be tilted toward your experience and what you're doing. And so people tend to worship the way that they believe about salvation, I think. And uh, Jordan Cooper, he wrote a helpful book on liturgical theology. I don't agree with everything that he said in the book by any means, but he gave um, some helpful, um, kind of a helpful taxonomy of different views on worship and kind of the purpose of it and what people do. And there was a few uh, kind of negative worships or worshiping types that he, he, he brings out. One is called the emotionally driven worship. And the emotionally driven worship is, is an approach where the Christian is in need of an experience. So we gather together in order to have some sort of a static experience, a mountaintop experience. And so everything in the worship is going to serve the, the, the individual's experience. And so it's going to make, worship is going to make it all about the individual and that individual's experiential relationship then with God. And it's going to be less about the individual's participation with the corporate body as they, um, as they interact between God and the church. It's going to be about your emotions that are going to be kind of the driving factor of, 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 of worship. And so everything is going to be tailored to that. The, the songs are going to be tailored to an ecstatic emotional experience, uh, kind of this uh, mountaintop experience where verses are going to be rapid, choruses are going to be repeated ad nauseum, uh, trying to almost create a trance-like state sometimes. Um, the Holy Spirit's presence will often be defined as a, a, a certain emotion where you'll identify an emotion within you and then you call that the Holy Spirit. And then if you feel that emotion, the Holy Spirit was there. And if you don't feel that emotion, then the Holy Spirit might not have been there. Maybe the worship wasn't uh, um, all that good of experience. And so in that setting, they would say, it doesn't matter what you believe. It matters how you experience or what you experience. Uh, Your experience then 
becomes the state or the health of your spiritual um, state, your, your uh, spiritual well-being. Uh, if you go into church and you display radical emotions, maybe it's a falling to the knees, a lifting of hands, a, uh, a, a crying, or whatever emotion it is, if you display that, then you are called a mature Christian at that point. Uh, when those things don't happen, maybe you lack spirituality. Um, this approach to worship has its roots in the Second Great Awakening, um, Charles Finney's new measures that he um, introduced into the church. Um, that's kind of driving this kind of um, worship style. Another, um, another style that he talks about in the book is the morally driven uh, worship, where um, the Christian community is primarily an, an ethical community. And they, they might use the phrase, deeds, not creeds. In this kind of a worship style, um, the redemptive message of Christ is usually um, reduced to kind of moralistic instructions. You know, do this or you, or you go to hell. You know, tithe your money. And, and every story in the Bible is just moral. You know, you need to be more like this guy, and you need to be less like this guy, and you better not be doing that. And it, everything just brought down to a level of pure morality, uh, divorced from the good news of Jesus Christ. And it's focused on, you know, societal change and the good old days. And um, uh, preaching is typically on social issues. Uh, you know, we need to rally everyone up to uh, protest that liquor store or that casino, or you know, we need to rid society of this and hand out um, tracts on politics and and so on and so forth. And it's more about that than it is what Christ actually did to people who were completely sinful and helpless. The um, the third kind of you know bad worship style that he talks about is the seeker driven church, uh, the seeker driven worship style, where worship is not about the covenant body coming together to glorify God and receive grace from Him. It's 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 not even really about edifying or discipling or growing um, uh, the sheep at all, or really any sort of covenantal dialogue between. Uh, the church and God, it's mainly all about the unbeliever, and it's driven by the unbeliever. The seeker-driven church will say, well, will ask, what does the unbelievers want? And then they just give the unbelievers whatever they want. So maybe they would come into uh, to church, and uh, the sermons are very basic, um, surface-level evan um, evangelistic devotions, to kind of you know to get people saved, to walk this aisle, to 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 to, to do something that would um, um, get them saved. They would have you know maybe big productions, concerts, loud music, videos, sermons about movies, topical kind of uh, presentations of things. Typically, would not walk through books of the Bible, lectio continua, expository preaching, but more again, a kind of a shallow revivalistic. Um, um, you need to be saved. You need to walk the aisle, um, trying to get unbelievers uh, just to come in. Uh, that kind of worship style was popularized during the ch church growth movement of the 1970s through the 1990s. Um, so those are kind of three bad worship styles that focus more about, it's a very man-centered, it's about you, it's about your emotional state or your moral duties or your uh, doing this or making this decision uh, for, for Christ, whereas the means of grace, the ordinary means of grace ministry is antithetical to that, it's different to that, it's, 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 it's um, not on the same page as the other ones. Uh, the, the ordinary means of grace ministry says the Lord's day is God's day, and, and on the Lord's day we have a divine service. It's called the divine service because it's God's doing. It's not our doing. Um, God is summoning his people to worship him in the way that he has pr prescribed to be worshipped. And as we worship, we are in a covenantal dialogue between our covenant head, 
uh, and, and, and us, the covenant body. And it's a back and forth conversation, a back and forth dialogue and worship as we glorify and praise um, God and as He uh, bestows grace and blessing um, up to us. We, we don't gather together because God needs anything, but we gather together because we need everything. We are helpless without Him. We need strength. We need grace. We need mercy. We need to meet with Christ and be fed by Christ through word and through sacrament. Um, now, that can be emotional. In fact, John Calvin talks about how the liturgy of the church really puts on display every emotion as we're confessing sin. Maybe there's guilt and there's um, lament. Uh, but then as we hear uh, the absolution of sin, there's gratitude and praise and love, and we um, hear the call to worship, and there's eager expectation. And so he talks about how through the liturgy of the church, um, really there's opportunity for every uh, type of emotion, but worship is not driven by emotionally charged experiences. In fact, you might be in, in, in an emotional valley one Sunday, and you come in and you leave and you didn't feel anything. But guess what? Christ was objectively present through word and through sacrament, and so you can look outside of yourself. And you can look to Christ, because Christ was there in a more intimate and more special way on the Lord's Day, in the divine service, through word and through sacrament with his corporate people, in a covenant dialogue with him. Um, he was there nourishing you. He was there strengthening you, uh, sealing Christ to you, whether you um, had some sort of emotional response or not. And so instead of seeking and it's some sort of a static experience or mountaintop experience, we seek an ordinary rhythm of dependence upon God through word and through sacrament. And the word ordinary is a good word. Um, and it is this ordinary life rhythm because you can't live a life mountaintop experience and mountaintop experience. Um, I think uh, Michael Horton calls them spiritual storm chasers. People who go around looking for tornadoes, you know, it's kind of people going around looking for some sort of uh, wild emotional experience. And what happens, so you, you might go to a conference and, and, and it's this uh, spiritually charged thing for you and you're on this mountain um, emotionally. But what happens when it wanes and it cools? Well, then you think maybe your spirituality waned and, and, and cooled. Maybe you think Christ isn't there. Maybe you're wondering if you're even saved. Maybe you're, well, and then, you, and then what do you do? Well, you look for the next big mountaintop experience to have another experience to bring you back up and then another experience to bring you back up. And you're on this roller coaster where you're questioning everything one moment and you're on, on this high mountain another moment and there's nothing ordinary. There's no rhythm about it. Um, rather, the ordinary means of grace is an ordinary rhythm of just dependence upon God that every single week I need Christ. I need to meet with Christ. I need to feast on Christ. I need to meet with Christ spiritually through word and through sacrament. Um, and that happens at the local church on the Lord's Day every single week, week in and week out. So I think that totally structures and recasts how you think about worship um, and again, connected to, I think, also how you think about salvation um, in general. So, Zach, um, you know, as, as pastors and churches are, are out there in the world, especially in our climate today where um, a lot of church numbers are on the wane and people are wondering, how do we get more people in? How do, how, how do we amass people? How do we grow the church and people are going to want to contextualize to this, this culture that we're in right now. Um, how are people going to contextualize? What are some paths that people might take as they try to contextualize Christianity for the culture to grow the church? Well, I think one of the things that we see from generation to generation, and we're certainly seeing that in our day right now, is that the sermons begin to uh, mirror whatever the new fads in the culture are. You see certain concerns right now about um, racial injustice, and I'm sure that there is um, a certain level of truth to it, but then that becomes the main messaging of the church, and that becomes like the moral improvement, like you said before, that we're just seeking to grow our church and changing our messaging to fit whatever the messaging is of the culture, 
to keep our churches relevant, make sure that we're influential. Um, we have this like myth of influence in the culture, as um, some of have described it. Uh, we see the the same kind of thing in terms of um, not just the the kind of uh, race reconciliation appro approach right now, but we see this politically speaking, whether on the left of the aisle or the right of the aisle or somewhere else, that those kinds of concerns can come can come into the church in terms of how we're going to so-called redeem America, whether it's a progressive agenda or a conservative agenda, then those can become the messaging things to uh, seek growth in numbers and size. We see that things are changing in terms of sexuality, and that too is, is uh, having its, um, that we're feeling that within the church in terms of the impact and effects of that as we are somehow rethinking and recasting Human, the teaching of the Bible on human sexuality that's been, that's been held for thousands of years now. But really what we're getting at here is to, as, as we become a church that's a means of grace church, depending upon God's methods, that means we're depending upon God for the results. We are entrusting ourselves, walking by faith, to say that we're not going to be given over to the various winds and waves of doctrine that surround us in the culture but rather we're going to follow the old paths. We're going to uh, do what God's commanded us to do because in doing what God commands us to do, he's going to care for his people. And that might mean the church shrinks. That might also mean the church grows. But God has a plan for his church here in Cincinnati and, and further afield throughout, across the world, across time. And he's going to accomplish it as he see, sees fit. And he's going to save his elect by word and by sacraments. He's going to uphold us, and so that's where we uh, concern ourselves within uh, the church's ministry. What are some th thoughts that you might have on this, Brandon? Yeah, um, you know, there, there are those who will say, well, to, to contextualize, to be relevant, we need to change our message. Mm -hmm. um, and, of course, I, I do think a lot of conservatives are saying, no, you can't change your, your message. The message of the gospel is the same yesterday, same today, same tomorrow. But there are going to be some who would say, okay, let's keep the message the same, but let's totally change the method. Sure. And mm -hmm. let's abandon kind of the ordinary means and let's try to wax creative every Sunday of some new, big, better thing to amass people and grow a church. Uh, but an ordinary, ordinary means of grace, like you said, um, not only heralds God's message, but also does it through God's methods. Mm -hmm. um, it's through word and sacrament. Um, and how are people um, going to believe in Christ unless they hear? hear? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. And so they, uh, the word, the sacraments, um, become the marching orders of the church. And when the church somehow forgets her marching orders and tries to, again, wax creative in some other way, be innovative in some other way, um, the, the church is going to miss the mark. Now, the church might be successful in amassing a crowd if they do, do, do something wild, um, but it's not going to be the crowd that ought to be amassed, perhaps, and it's not going to be in the way that God has commanded it, and you're going to be in dereliction of duty because... Um, the things that God has told us to herald and to do and to the, his, his message, his methods are going to be left behind. And so, yeah, an ordinary, ordinary means of grace church is in the faithfulness business, not in the results business. It's, I'm going to be faithful. Um, now, obviously, it's not all about our faithfulness or how awesome we are, but it's about um, our, our reliance upon God, his gospel, his methods, his ways, and uh, trusting him for all of the results, whether that's to shrink or to grow, um, and not uh, not idolizing, as um, Scott Clark says, you know, bodies, buildings, and budgets. Uh, those can become idols in the church, and um, yeah, we ought to ought to again rest in God's results. I think it might be worthwhile right now to reflect a little bit about how this might change your outlook, practically speaking. I know that. For myself, I came from a very emotionally uh, driven background where I was a spiritual storm chaser, as you described there, and it left me burnt out and asking questions about my own salvation. But when I st stood back to reflect upon it, my belief in Christ hadn't changed, 
but it was what I was seeking after that that uh, um, was was the problem, yeah. which caused me to have to revisit everything and to say, okay, what's the Christian life supposed to look like? What's worship supposed to look like? How do I avoid this um, uh, pit of despair that results when I'm not having the kind of emotional feeling that I thought I'm supposed to have that demonstrates my maturity in Christ and reassures me of my faith week after week? What what then? What uh, where where do I go from this? I found I found refuge in what you were describing as this kind of rhythm of uh, walking by faith, not by sight. Sight would be like experience, right? Mm-hmm. So we're walking by faith, not by sight. Walking um, humbly, uh, knowing that we're weak and we're sinful on this side of glory, and that God has given us um, lowly things to meet us in our weakness. I found great help in that. Uh, Brandon, how about you? You've found something similar in your um, in your move from your former background to a means of grace church now? I think so. Um, there's more of, a fo- <clears throat> more of a focus, I think, on Christ. Um, it's not about, you know, what I want and, you know, I like this and I want that song set, sung and I want it done this way and, and I want to be entertained or I want this experience or, or this uh, moral thing that I need to be doing or uh, it, it just recalibrates worship where I'm not coming in to somehow uh, be some sort of consumer, mere, some mere consumer of some entertainment venue. Um, I'm not coming in to... Um, have a guilt trip of what I'm not doing um, constantly, um, but I'm coming in confessing my faults, hearing God's pardon, and receiving Christ through word and through sacrament. And it's more focused on Christ. It's more restful. It's more covenantal. It's more um, um, sustainable. Sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, for sure, su- sustainable. And, um, yeah, I think it just kind of goes back to how we view the gospel and salvation as all of God, all of God's grace. Church is God's doing, not our doing, and it, it reflects that in the means of grace. Uh, if, you, if you want more information uh, about this, if you want to kind of dig into to means of grace, the Heidelberg Catechism, again, great place to start because it just so helpfully talks about the ordinary means of grace. Um, also, there's a book called uh, What Happens When We Worship by Jonathan Cruz, and he kind of talks about what this means of grace, ordinary rhythm of dependence, what that, what that looks like, what's happening in worship, how God is meeting us in worship, and uh, what's happening there with means of grace. Very helpful book. So, uh, do you have anything to add to that? I don't. Just thanks so much for joining us today. Brandon, thanks for your reflections on this. I hope that's been helpful. hope that... Um, you consider uh, these things and uh, the, sh- the shape of your Christian life and the shape of the church's worship in order to find a sustainable Christianity and a faithful Christianity, humbly receiving Christ and Word and Sacrament. So thanks for joining us. This is the Cincy Reformed Podcast, and we are sponsored by Westside Reformed Church. We invite you to check us out. We are a URC congregation on the west side of Cincinnati, and we hope to see you again. Thanks. Thank you.